Ah, the mysterious water. Water occupies 71% of the Earth's surface. Our human bodies also contain 60% of water. Water is such quintessential to our life. Naturally, folklore and horror binds with water element as well. In Chinese folklore, it is believed that a person, if drowned in a tragic manner, will return as a vengeful water ghost and will claim the lives of other people from the point where he was drowned. However, we don't see many films that depict a vengeful water ghost and most of the horror which involves a big body of water is mainly creatures from the abyss. Director Steven Spielberg brought us the granddaddy of the monster from the water with 1975's Jaws, which spawned a few sequels, including one that fed Sir Michael Caine's family for a while. The lingering fear of the great white shark and fascination of their prehistoric ancestor, the Megalodon, spawned films for decades, including Deep Blue Sea from 1999 and Into the 2000s with 2003's Open Waters, 2016's The Recommended Shallows and 2017's 47 Meters Down. In recent times, we had The Mac with Jason Statham and its sequel and The Black Demon. Oh, we don't talk about their disowned cousins, the Sharknado franchise. Jaws also inspired Roger Corman, the Pope of Pop Cinema, to make 1978's Piranha with a young Joe Dante as director and the 1982 sequel with a pre-Terminator director, James Cameron. In 2010, The Hills Have Eyes director, Alejandro Aja, did a fun remake, Piranha 3D. We also have horror flicks of the other fearsome aquatic beasts, with 1980 Alligator, which took the fear into a more urban backdrop. This spawned other movies of Killer Crocs and Alligator, most notably with 1999's Lake Placid and 2019's Crawl another creature feature from Alejandra Aja. Aquatic creature horror was easy to delve into science fiction and fantasy elements, starting with one of the key universal monsters, Creature from Black Lagoon from 1954. The movie, like all Golden Age universal monsters, inspired filmmakers and of course, Mexican auteur Guillermo del Toro with his 2017's The Shape of Water, which won him multiple accolades. The scary unknown of the deep also led to the fear of whether alien beings would be hiding in the dark chasm waiting to take over our world. Between 1988 and 1989, we have three movies that delve into such fear. Deep Star 6, Leviathan, and James Cameron again with The Abyss. In 1998, Rain Man director Barry Livingston adapted Sphere from Jurassic Park scribed Michael Crichton to lukewarm box office response. In 2020, we see Kristen Stewart doing her own version of Ripley in Underwater. Actually, if you search for aquatic horror movies, you generally will get movies as what I had listed, and nothing more of the supernatural context. To me, the one that really looked into Chinese folklore of water ghosts and the vengeful curse of someone being killed by drowning would have to be 1988's Spook Spook, directed by Hong Kong action star Samo Hong, which combined comedy and horror immaculately and one of his most underrated work. Hey, perhaps James Cameron could take his foot off that avatar pedal and give us another chilling horror from the waters. Speaking of Cameron... There's a boat, Jack. Oh.
Okay, maybe not that. Welcome Lights of Family to the fourth installment of After Dark. This will be After Dark first foray into movie review and I'll be doing Night Swim, the first studio horror flick of 2024. Just a caveat, I'm not a film student nor a film journalist, so whatever thoughts that are shared are to be taken with a pinch of salt. Criticisms are welcome, although it might stink a little. I will stay clear of any spoilers, but if there is any, I will give a warning. So for now, enjoy the four horror movies that use water as a plot element. Blumhouse Studio hit a jackpot with Megan in 2023, which was released in January, a usually off-peak season for movie goers. Made with a measly budget of $12 million, Megan raked in $181 million, another Blumhouse miraculous windfall. And this time with James Wan and his Atomic Monster Studio, they felt they need to hit the iron when it's hot. Director Bryce McGuire made a short film 10 years ago about a horror encounter during, as the title implied, a night swim. McGuire and co-writer Rob Blackhurst got commissioned to make a full-length feature with a backstory. According to the Wikipedia page for Night Swim, McGuire cited Blumhouse's own films as well as other films such as Portuguese, Creature from Black Lagoon, Jaws, Christine, The Night of the Hunter and The Abyss as the film's sources of inspiration. He also described the film story as a semi-autobiographical in connection to his childhood and adolescence. It was blatant that Maguire's inspirations and homages spread even further. We will talk about that later. In terms of story and characters, I felt this was a template quality. Maguire playing it safe, nothing too extraordinary. I know of Americans' fascination with dipping in swimming pool during the sweltering heat of the summer, but this family's whole life seems to revolve around that pool. But for the father figure, portrayed by Wyatt Russell, there was a legit reason for a sort of dependence on the swimming pool. Oh, Wyatt Russell. Came from great A gym pool of actors Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. To be truthful, looks like a real life Muppet and a very punchable face. However, in Night Swim, he was much tolerable, perhaps a subdued performance, and his hair was immaculate. Oh, the hair. Anyway, the more eye-catching performance come from Carrie Condon, who played the mother of the family. The Irish actress, who is a regular casting member in Martin McDonough's movies, and the voice of Friday for Iron Man's system in those MCU's movies, gave a sound performance, playing the sensible one, and did a lot of heavy lifting at the climax of the film. There's a law that needed some unraveling, but I did not find the unraveling to be done well. The scary set pieces on the other hand were effective. This showed that it's always designed to be a short film to display Maguire's talent in scaring audience, but fell short as a storyteller. Of course, he certainly had room to grow. While Night Swim was not as awful as people online had aggregated, the many references Maguire drew certainly was too blatant for horror fans. The actions of the father character as the plot thickens certainly reminded me of the Ryan Reynolds character in 2005, The Amityville Horror. And then a cursed swimming pool that brought terror to the family. Hmm, where had we heard that before? Oh, and this scene. So for a nifty 98 minutes horror movie, Night Swim is not going to go down in history as one of the better horror movies, but it's not a torture to sit through. I will give it 6 out of 10. There's a key plot on why the father character is so enchanted by the swimming pool, which led me to think of the next movie. Have 
have you watched The Mexican before? Or Nick Cage in The Weatherman? Or the modern adaptation of The Lone Ranger? How about the quirky western animated feature Rango? Okay, you surely should have watched the first three installments of the Pirates of Caribbean series. Gore Rabinsky, a director who had a pretty good run in the 2000s, making interesting genre films in the good books of Disney Studios and had a bigger infatuation of Johnny Depp than Amber Heard. He had a taste for the horror genre with the American adaptation of Ringu and did a nifty job. Of course, Naomi Watts played a big part. Then things came to a halt after he made a cure for wellness in 2016, which was a financial bomb. Inspired by Thomas Mann's 1924 novel, Magic Mountain, Berminsky and scriptwriter Justin Heath told a story of a sanatorium that's shrouded by mystery with a protagonist unraveling by putting himself in immense danger doing it. Hmm. The plot sounded very much like Martin Scorsese's Shutter Island, isn't it? Even the protagonist Lockhart, played by Dane DeHaan, had a bootleg feel of Leonardo DiCaprio. The movie's plot wrapped closely with our theme of water and even fire. The 147 minutes runtime certainly is daunting for a casual watch. But I thought Verbinski and Haif paced the plot pretty exquisitely. The movie did not feel too much of a drag. Dehan, who came into prominence in the pseudo superhero flick Chronicle, had a very punchable face like Wyatt Russell. And Verbinski certainly put him through trials and tribulations here. Yet he was engaging as Lockhart, the executive assigned to bring back their CEO from the Swiss Wellness Center. Playing opposite Dehan was Lucius Malfoy himself from the Harry Potter series and it was not hard to feel the antagonistic energy simmering from the British actor Jason Isaac. Isaac's Mr. Volmer and the creepy crew of the Wellness Center with their antic, as well as the patients of the sanatorium definitely added a lot to the story. It was an enthralling journey just opposing between grievous body horror and gorgeous scenic backdrop from Germany. And yeah, a pre ex and pearl Maya Goff, as you can see a scream queen in the making. As Hannah, she was a sort of MacGuffin to the plot, and the young Goff did not stuck out like a sore thumb. I would give a cure for wellness a 7 out of 10. Some people would classify this as a slow burn psychological horror, but for me, I don't think so. There was a key scene when Lockhart was nearly drowned in a water tank, which led us to the next film. I sort of had shunned 2005 Hollywood remake of Hideo Nakata's original similar with other J-horror remakes like The Ring and The Grudge. Of course, that 2002 original left a scar in me which took years to mend. More on that later. For the longest time, I thought Verbinski directed this remake as well. But it was Brazilian director Walter Salus, who I thought did not do a bad job telling the story for the first half of the movie at least. I like the change of scenery to the dreary landscape of the Roosevelt Island, with the sogginess and the unrelentless cold. The godforsaken building might not be as bleak as the Japanese version, but when you have the late great Pete Possewife as the superintendent of the building, some order was in place. The dichotomy of the custody battle and the leaking apartment did not stray too much away from the original film. But there was something else with the backstory of Jennifer Connelly's character, which had echo of Requiem of a Dream. Connelly's performance was stellar, yet there was a lack of vulnerability found in Kuroki Hitomi in the original. Here without her, the movie would lose a lot of gloss. CC, the young actress also paled in comparison to the Japanese version. 
the fault might be she could actually add better, taking away some of the raw authenticity. The supporting cast of Possewave, John C. Riley as the property agent, and Tim Roth as the lawyer really did not add much, especially the side characters did not matter much if you watched the original. Sadly, the main gist of the horror was not well captured by Salus and his crew as the critics' consensus on Rotter Tomato stated all the atmospherics in dark water can't make up for the lack of genuine scares. Sadly, I will give dark water 5 out of 10. Now to the film from Japan that shook me to my core. The year was 2002 when things were much simpler and McDonald's meals did not cost $9. It was at the height of J-horror after Hideo Nakata's Ringu and the solemn yet disturbing way to scare audience spread like wildfire to the whole of Asia. After creating the wave with Ringu and Ringu 2, Nakata's next horror feature was an adaptation of Ringu author Koji Suzuki's short story, Honogurai Mizu no Soko Kara, or From the Depths of the Dark Water. I was not one to spend money to watch horror flicks in the cinema, but I did with my then girlfriend, now wife, to catch dark water in the big cinema in town. It was my window into the dreary mood that Nakata had orchestrated, and being wrapped in the plot, it was easy to be shaken by the scares on the screen. The screaming from the theater audience just amplified the effective scare that would carry it with me long after the movie was over. That night, I was afraid to take the elevator or even open the tap. For weeks, I was petrified to look at the corridors after sunset. What really made Dark Water so intriguing was the story of a mother struggling for custody of her daughter and trying to make a living in a very patriarchal society where a working mother and a relatively unsupportive childcare system crippled the protagonist and even had a hand in the source of the haunting. It was a truly sad tale and the vulnerability of the mother played by Hitomi Kuroki, a well-known actress from the Takarazuka Review, was easy to empathize with. Her life was aimed at protecting her daughter, yet there were so many obstacles to frustrate her and such vulnerable situations put her in perils that gripped the audience till the very end. I am sure I will touch on more J-horror in the future movie reviews. But, Dark Water was such a subtle but effective entry into the genre, and Nakata was at its artistic best. No doubt this is an 8 upon 10 for me. So this is it, my first movie review for After Dark. Boy, what a hefty 4 movies review in a row. Hope you guys enjoyed it. As usual, please support Joe, Kim, Matt and rest of the gang in all Lights Out live streams. Good night and don't let the bed bugs bite.